Hey, hello, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director at All Brains Belong Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club, our weekly community conversation on everyday brain life things. And tonight we are going to be talking, we're going to be continuing our conversation on urgency culture. Today it'll be about urgency culture in everyday life. We'll be joined by a, um, a, a, a panel of community members and we'll have lots of time for discussion. But um, before we before we dive into our topic, um, I'm just going to go over some um, introductory kind of like uh, community agreement and housekeeping type stuff and do a, a, a quick recap of 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 last week's spring club because it was it's uh, it, it, it framed, I think, really some so like because because urgency culture is the theme for the month. And so uh, last week we we talked about what urgency culture even is and uh, how how this plays out in in so many ways um, and has a, a profoundly negative impact on health for everybody. All right, so come on, all the Zoom toolbars. I can't see anything. Okay, great. So, um, uh, especially if this is your first brewing club, just want to introduce you for, to like brewing club culture. Um, all forms of participation are okay here. So, uh, as 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 you, as many have figured out already, uh, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we certainly don't expect anything of you. You don't need to look at the camera. You don't need to sit still. Just do what needs doing. And yes. Everyone is welcome. Um, so, you know, if your kids are climbing on you or your pets or, you know, everyone, welcome. And you're all welcome to communicate however you're most comfortable, whether that is speaking, using mouth words, um, or typing in a chat box, or, you know, any of the above ways of, 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 of communicating. Um, a word about language. You'll hear myself and likely uh, many other people here using identity first language. So for example, I am autistic um, because uh, 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 being autistic is part of my identity and does not need to be separated from it. That's not the case for everybody. And so everyone is welcome to use the language to describe their own identity. Um, speaking of identity, um, it's really important to us that we are affirming all aspects of identity, not just neurotype, but gender, sexuality, race, um, all, all the forms of diversity that, that our community um, um, is. And um, uh, in addition to respecting and protecting one another's access needs, um, we really want to make sure that this stays a safe place by remaining um, an educational event. This is uh, not, not, not a place uh, where we'll be giving medical advice. And specifically, individual traumatic experiences are best processed in uh, a therapeutic setting, not, not, a, not a burn club. Okay, to recap, um, uh, Sarah, I'm quoting you. You ever been quoted on a brain club slide before? It's happening because uh, I thought this was like for in, in my mind this was this this was my highlight um, at, at 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 the at the end of uh, last week's spring club. Sarah said, "For me, conversation used to be sharing what I want to share. Now I'm looking to connect with what you said, and you're looking to connect with with what I said." And so new idea to grow the community agreement. So and when Sarah said that, it was in the context of talking about processing time and quiet space to be able to make sure that Brain Club is a, a, a place where people with all kinds of communication access needs can participate. Um, first off, observation is completely valid as a as a as a participation um uh, method um and um if people do want to be um uh communicating directly either um you know with with um spoken speech or typing in the chat box we want to make sure that the conversation can slow down enough to be able to give people the opportunity to enter a conversation um, there's 
Uh, there's some people with the kind of brains that like the idea is ping pong, it goes so fast. And for others, it's really hard to get a word in edgewise. And so um, just to, to cue safety, I just want to say that up front that we are going to be looking today to create space and time for everyone who wants to, to have space and time. Um, because that is going to be, it's going to allow us to facilitate community connection and, um, you know, moving beyond taking turns talking. Last bit of access uh, uh, is if you'd like to use closed captioning, it's already enabled. It's just that you have to toggle it on at your end. So depending on your version of Zoom, you are likely to see either the live transcript CC button, or if not, try the more dot dot dot, and you can choose show subtitles or hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. The other day I participated um, as, as, a, as, as a participant in, in an activity that did not have captions um, enabled, uh, and it, 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 was, it, it was just so torturous. Um, uh, it was really very, very difficult, and I think it, it's an example of so many people live life overriding their access needs. There are barriers in the environment that interfere with full and meaningful participation. And that is, you know, that's what we talk about at Brain Club all the time. So how does this connect to urgency culture? So we talked about culture um, as, as and defined by Angela Burkfield as a shared set of norms, values, ways of life, assumptions about how the world works. And that um, many aspects of culture are based on power systems. And when we think about urgency culture, like the, it's important, do it now, ah, um, like not everything that sends off the signals of like, this requires now, ah, um, is actually urgent or important. And yet like it, a lot of us spend a lot of time um, getting those messages and spend all the time putting out fires, which is, bad for health um, and just produces a, a great deal of stress um, and, and ultimately contributes to burnout for many people. So, and when we, when we zoom way out, um, urgency culture is a product of um, unjust power systems. Um, and so, you know, all of the discriminatory isms, which are all connected in one way or another, you know, they're all related. Um, and, 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 you know, the, 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 the quest for efficiency, productivity, the search, like it's, 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 it's capitalism, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's everything. It's power over. And we talked about last week how urgency culture fueling internalized ableism. So that is the discriminatory belief that it is better to be able to do the thing and then turned in on oneself internalized discriminatory beliefs against ourselves that we should be able to do the thing. Um, when you get the message that it's bad to set boundaries, your access deeds don't matter, um, and you have a pattern of overriding your limbic responses to things that are unsafe. Um, uh, for, for those of you who follow us on social media and maybe Lizzie, can you post in the chat the link to Luna's, um, to Luna's uh, uh, reel from last week? Uh, my my six-year-old uh, helped, helped edit our reel of the week um, about, about urgency culture. She was very proud of herself. She's not in the video, but she, she, uh, she was tinkering with iMovie. She was very pleased. Anyway, about, about, about this, because um, urgency culture, once you can recognize and you zoom out and you, 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 if you're committed to any form of, you know, social justice framework, anti-bias framework, like once you connect urgency culture to that and you spot that, I think for, a, a, for I can only speak for myself, it's so much easier to reject it when you've connected it with unjust power systems. So interrupting assumptions of urgency culture. So, you know, like, like any other anti-bias framework, um, we, wanna, we wanna avoid supporting systems that perpetuate power over others. And urgency culture is one of those things. And when we, when we, when we think about social justice framework of things that we're striving for in a just society, um, urgency culture interferes with those things. And so if we shift out of that to emphasize collective well-being, 
rejecting urgency culture, I think is part of that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our community panelists. Hold on, I wasn't looking at the chat. Now I see there's a chat box. Oh, cool, there's, okay, it's great, perfect. All right, so um, what I'll do is I'm gonna spotlight. All right, so we've got spotlight and spotlight and sorry for talking out loud um that's how i support my motor planning and spotlight okay here we go all right so um our I, i'll just introduce everybody and then um you can just decide who wants to say what all right so um sarah knutson is an ex-lawyer ex-therapist and survivor activist um, and a half century of buying into urgency culture left Sarah exhausted and demoralized uh, from trying to play an unwinnable, unsustainable, culturally promoted zero sum game. And they spent the past decade trying to rethink and recover all of this. And so um, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for, 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 for being here. Um, and we oh, are also joined by Kelly Bordeaux from Fairfax, um, who is um, a, a homeschooling two children, she's got a family of four, um, half autistic, half non-autistic, and Kelly is also um, a, a, a fellow in uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disability leadership um, at the University of Vermont. Christine Donnelly um, came to find All Brains Belong as a way of better understanding herself as an autistic person and to advocate for her two neurodivergent children. Um, and Christina is continually uh, uh, continuing to unlearn all of the ableist beliefs that she once held interacting with like-minded individuals um, has been very validating freeing. And I'm so glad that you are all here. And I would love to hear from whoever wants to share your thoughts on how urgency culture is, you know, is impacting your lives. I'll go first because my cold medicine is wearing off. So, <laughs> which I want to open up with yesterday. I was in a group medical visit for all brains and I was saying like, man, my energy has just been so low. I've like sat on my kitchen floor for hours today, like doing nothing. And then I woke up this morning with this huge cold and I'm like, oh, it's not that I was doing nothing. It's that I didn't recognize that I was getting sick. So I have to get better at recognizing that I'm getting sick. I think my husband laughed at me as I made this like epiphany moment in the kitchen. He's like, yes, I could have told you that you're getting sick. And that's where I realized that my husband's kind of like my service animal because he'll also let me know that, I, that I'm going to be having a migraine soon. So he, like, he's good. He's good like that. <laughs> um, so when Mel asked if I want to talk about urgency culture. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I spent the next week being like, I have not been really impacted by urgency culture. And I realized it's because I have just recognized it as not feeling safe. So I've kind of stayed away from anything <laughs> that, that made me have to hit a milestone or, or, you know, hit a deadline in X amount of time. You know, I, didn't go to college right out of high school because I was like, that just sounds like the worst thing a person could do ever. And I did the second worst thing, which is then I worked retail for the next 10 years. And that was just <laughs> horrific, <laughs> horrific. Um, and I, I didn't go to college until I was like in my thirties. And I didn't have children until I was in my thirties. Like everything needed for me to feel safe. And I didn't recognize that until I started thinking about it. And I was just kind of like processing this with my whole family at the dinner table just now. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about because I feel like I've avoided any system that has urgency culture until I'm ready to be there. And even then, you know, like I chose the smallest college that you know, Burlington had. I went to Burlington College. Oh, I'm so sad that it's not around anymore. But, you know, I had classes of eight people. It was fantastic. You know, my master's program was all, I was just on my own. Like I was in with nobody. It was just me, you know, and that was 
perfect. And, you know, I'm doing this Vermont Len program and, you know, it's self-paced more or less. Um, and well, it's not the funnest, like, I don't feel like it's a lot of demand for me. And I feel very fortunate and lucky that I've had the opportunity to be able to not put myself into situations that that don't feel right. Like I'm grateful to my husband for being a great support animal. <laughs> um, and uh, which I did tell him that to his face. So I don't think he got too offended. <laughs> um, but I, it makes me think, you know, I'm homeschooling my older son who is autistic. And one of the programs that we use, like I edit it every time we hit certain pages where it'll be like, okay, now answer the next questions as quickly and write as you can. And I'm just like, whoa, let's just answer the questions. Like we don't need to focus on being quick and being right. Like let's just read the problem and understand it and then answer it. And, you know, I see the, the stress kind of like fall off his shoulders when I give him that permission to, to go against that system, to go against that demand that this math program is putting on him or that this literacy program is putting on him. And it frustrates me for the kids that I know are being like pushed and fed like, oh, it says you have to do it quick, 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 quick. Oh, you got one wrong. Start over. You know, like, whoo, it like raises my blood pressure. It just brings me to a panic thinking about that. And, you know, my younger son does go into school, but there are days where he'll just be like, mom, I just, I just can't go today. And I'm like, you know what? Okay. And I call him out and I'm like mental health day. Like he's just taking a break, you know, like we all need these breaks. And so I'm hopeful that while I avoided the urgency culture, just by luck and, you know, intuitively almost, that I'm teaching them to see it and to be able to, to say either, yes, I can meet that demand or no, I can't do that. And here's why, or not even here's why, just no, that's a very complete sentence. Um, and uh, so, so I think about that more of it, how it impacts my kids, you know, cause I do hear them like, okay, so I have to go to college right out of school. And I'm like, no. You, you don't have to do that, you know, or, oh, so my friends are starting dating. So do I have to date? Like, no, no, you don't have to do that. And like all these systems put so much pressure on people for no reason that I can see. Like, I, I do understand certain deadlines and, you know, things like that. But like, I think that, that we move so quickly that we're not able to pay attention to anything. And then we complain that nobody has an attention span when we're not given the chance to have one. Um, and I think I took my five minutes. So I wanna make sure that everybody else gets their turn. So I think that's my, my stance on urgency culture is I, I've done my best to avoid it and I'm trying to teach my kids to see it and I do my best to fight against it when I can for others. Amen, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just reading in the chat. Sarah says, what a beautiful gift you're giving your children, Kelly, by talking so openly with your children about all of this. Absolutely. Because, I mean, this is how cultural assumptions, you know, spread. Like, if you're not, like, zooming out and, and, and naming them transparently, let alone wondering where they come from, like, that's the next step, right? But if you don't even see them, that you just get swept, swept right into that. So thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for showing us, um, you know, what's possible if you do it differently. Are you imagining? Christina, Sarah, who wants to go next? Sure, I'll go. I, I liked the prompts that were given because I, I like a scaffold and a structure, but um, but I'll try to um do you want me to do you, do you want me to read them to you? No, no, I wrote it down. Um, so I had I had like prompts, but um, so one of them was like how has urgency culture shown for you growing up? And um, I don't think I think I was born like into a into a setting that was like prime for it. it wasn't subtle. Um, there was literally a sign outside. Um, my siblings and I bedroom door that said, I'm the daddy, that's why. So like it was compliance, like 
no questions. And uh, so that was that was one thing. It was like you're not allowed to speak out. Um, I was not great at that um, as a child. <laughs> uh, and uh, but the other thing that was kind of a part of the structure was um, scheduling like competitive sports and like um, academics was like uh, a thing that was like um, part of my family structure and my sisters did really well with it, but I always felt really uncomfortable with it. Um, and at, sometimes I was able to participate and sometimes I like really resisted it um, just because it didn't feel good. And I think that kind of like, um, I went through this process um, throughout like growing up and then like going to school and like realizing that I couldn't really um, fit into that well and like still be okay. So I would like spurt forward and like then have a time where I had to like take a break and now that I look back on it, I realized like I was hitting burnout periods, but I didn't know it like then because I didn't know I was autistic. Um, so now, you know, I've, you know, recalibrated everything. I work from home exclusively and it allowed me to kind of just like see that um, when that kind of comes up, when I feel like um, there's like an obligation to go to like a social event or an obligation to like, um, you know, do something a certain way and just really be able to like see that. Um, but it took like a whole restructuring of how I did my life. Um, and I still have this kind of like days when I'm kind of like, you know, I, I can't do all the things. And there's like some voice inside me that still has that stuff from my childhood. That's like, you need to do the things. It's important to do the things. Um, and I have to kind of like, logic my way through it and just like talk myself through the um inner voice that's like talking like that and I think Mel mentioned that um and uh, the one thing that I I think that I have really resisted urgency culture in is like that childhood has definitely allowed me to see how I don't want to uh, my children to experience the world and um so I just kind of, when I had kids, I just decided that I was going to take my cues from them and um, try to, you know, understand what they needed and what supports that they um, required. And if they were crying that they needed to be held. And if, you know, if that meant that I, I literally like had to strap my kid to myself, like all the time while I was doing chores, that's what they needed. And that's what I did. And, um, you know, sleeping on the floor in the bedroom next to the child because they, they needed somebody to co-regulate with. Um, and I, that was what I, I did. And, um, I think that for them, it's allowed them to be able to tell me when they're feeling uncomfortable and it's allowed them to be able to express, um, back to me, their feelings, even if maybe it might hurt my feelings, or I might, you know, it might be something that isn't kind to hear. Um, it just, it's important for them to hear their, I hear their voice. So then we have a platform to really talk about like, what is going on. But without that, like ability for them to express, um, it's very hard to kind of understand the why of why they might be feeling a certain way. So um, I think that is like how I've mostly gone against um, the uh, urgency culture for myself. And I think it is changing. I do see parents doing things differently. I do see people working differently. I see groups like this, which wouldn't have existed, you know, when I was even in college. So um, I think that it is going the right direction. I think having conversations like this and sharing things like this that, um, and, and just like advocating and, and getting the message out there can make people see things. Maybe there's a different way to go about this. Maybe I don't have to, you know, always do it the way that the book tells me to, or something like that. And that's kind of how I, I think I've, I'm, I am right now. I feel like I'm still identifying those 
embedded ableist beliefs that I have um, that I feel come up when my body feels like, you know, nervous or anxious, then I have to like, all right, what is going on here and try to maybe make it a little adjustment for myself um, or my kids. And I think that's key, but you have to step away from it, I think, in order to like see it. So that's what I have to say. Totally. Like that's the zooming out thing. Cause like when you're in it, you're, you're, you don't have access to your cortex, like these higher level observation, interpretation, connecting it to past and present. Like that's all stuff you can't do when you're dysregulated. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, 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 for showing us a better way. And it's, it's like part of the unlearning process. Like it, it, it's, and I think there are many of us who grew up with very similar childhood narratives and that makes it often all the more difficult to, 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 to catch it. Um, and so thank you for modeling that. Just catching up in the chat, um, uh, feedback from community members, Lizzie said, so powerful that you're listening to, to your intuition. And Kat says, it's so good to be in a place where those things are normalized, like sleeping near your children when they need co-regulation. Yeah, totally. Um, and Kelly says, I feel like helping my kids process helps me understand so much more as well. I'm not here to mold them, but to help them unfold. I love that. Sarah says, it's a lifelong journey. And Olivia's, Olivia was responding beautiful um, as you were speaking. And uh, I, 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 I shared my story um, about, uh, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, when, when, when you catch yourself caught up in the moment um, with, 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 with your kids. Um, uh, Luna said to me last week um, after, after helping with the Instagram reel, she says, Mama, stop rushing me. Urgency culture is rooted in power systems. She's six. It's pretty proud. Anyway, Sarah. So just, uh, sorry, struggling to, um, frantically struggling to unmute, which seems appropriate for urgency culture. Um, uh, uh, deep breaths here. Um, so I guess, you know, it's interesting because I'm just sitting here realizing how much urgency culture is affecting me right here, right now in the moment. Um, urgency, at least the messages I got tell me all right, I have to say something fascinating. It has to capture your attention. Um, it has to, um, I have to say it fast. It has to come out of my mouth the right way. Um, and if, um, and, um, if, it, if it isn't interesting and engaging, um, then you'll move on to something else and drop me um, like a hot rock um, as a human being. I mean, that's what urgency culture tells me about human communications. It's the, really the commoditization of human communications. Like if it doesn't entertain me, if you don't entertain me, I'm moving on to something better and more interesting, goodbye. Um, and if you want to capture my attention in um, a coffee cave, coffee shop conversation, then you better, um, you, you better think of something fun and interesting and engaging to say. Um, so that's how it relationally affects, um, affects me. Um, how it affected me as a kid um, and, and growing up um, was um, I, it's hard for me to separate urgency culture from um, productivity, from the cultural values around productivity and performance. So um, as a kid, my, um, my, my two best friends went to kindergarten I'm four, five years old and old enough to get into kindergarten, but my two best friends are, uh, but, but my mom, my mom um, thinks that it would be better for me um, maturationally to, to stay back because my birthday is sort of on the borderline. My two best friends go off to school and, and I'm, and I'm immediately introduced or probably knew about it before, but, but I'm at least they're immediately introduced to status competition, which is I'm a first, I'm a kindergartner and you're not. And um, urgency culture is really hard to separate from status competition for me too, 
which is really about like in, in, in human, it's a human created way for me to compete with you for resources that both of us need and can't live without. So it's unwinnable and unsustainable. You and I are both competing. We're competing for each other's energy and attention and um, resources um, like food and, and the housing and everything else that, that none of us can live without and yet we're competing with each other to have them. Um, and, and, um, and, uh, and, and a lot of those things we could give each other freely. We could give each other, you know, they're not, they don't cost any money. I could give you my attention. Um, and I could, you know, and I could give you my caring and I can, it, even if I don't have a scent, I can, it can still matter to me that you're hurting. And a lot of those things we withhold from each other as a matter of, and as a matter of status and as a matter of like, uh, I know something, I, you know, I know something that you don't. Um, that gives me value, um, and there's just so many ways that um, we, I, that that I learned to compete with you. Perhaps you learned to compete with me. I don't know, but I, I know that I spent the first easily the first 30, 40 years of my life in a kind of uncritic, uncritical way, just competing with probably everybody I met, um, on and comparing myself on some level to everybody I met, whether I knew more than them, whether I had more than them, whether I did more than them. Um, whether I weighed more than them, um, you know, all of those, all of those things, we were all on a, we we're, were all on some kind of a measurement scale, um, and uh, I internalized those, um, those. I mean, I, I obviously, you can see it just as I'm talking how much I internalized those values um, from from my neighborhood, from the neighborhood I grew up in, from the school, I, from the school, from my family, um, and um, the effect that it had on me was um I it, my I spent my this great entire grade school not caring about the kids that I was in class with because I was always trying to catch up with the two kids who went to class school a year ahead of me. That's that's you know so all I cared about was academics and all I cared about, you know, how can how can I get to school to see me as smart enough to deserve to be in the class that rightfully I should have been in, in the first place. Um and then that um just uh then that just transformed to the point where, um, uh, since I didn't have any social relationships, because I didn't care about the kids that I was in the same class with, um, all I cared about was, I mean, I cared about the school stuff. Um, so, um, and um, it just transformed into approving my, just proving my worth. I was studying three and a half hours in middle school. By the time I was in, high, by, by getting through high school, I and had a bunch of, um, I don't know if they do, people ever, everywhere does high school letters, but you know, I mean, like had 15 high school letters and a 4.0 um, grade point in, in high school. And, um, and what I can tell you is that um, at age 60, a bunch of people have had like much more socially connected, much more socially worthwhile, much more family pr productive lives than I had. You know, I, I sort of came out of my high school as a shining star and the example of what you know every kid should aspire to be, and um, went off to a service academy to to try to prove it, and um, and then began to deteriorate from there, and so um, and as you know sort of and and so um, and and so in many ways I started out as the poster child for urgency culture, and then and then as a matter of sort of emotional and self-survival then had, had have had to really seriously rethink um, what I was taught and, and begin to really question, you know, it, I guess uh, I'll stop with just one more example is, you know, it really strikes me that like, you know, if we're living on the family farm um, and we have a cow, um, we actually, you know, um, we're, we're intimately connected to that cow. And, um, and that, and like, and we might even like really actually care about that cow as a member of the family and and when the cow dies, I mean, there's a there's a there's like this grief. It's it's maybe even more than more than milk to us. Um, and um, and how commodity culture works is I is I is I go to the store and 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 I buy a carton of milk. And when your cow dies, I just buy another carton of milk. So that's what we're losing is uh, from the commodity culture, or at least what I feel like I'm losing from the commodity culture is really. The, the price of that is relationships and caring, and um, and the, the benefit is I you know get a carton of milk when your cow dies. So anyway, thanks.
Sarah, that was just like, I just wanted, like, I, 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 it's, it's interesting. Uh, when I, when I went back and listened to parts of the recording from last week, um, I like wish I had a recording of what you just said to listen to right now. Um, I was trying to capture things along the way, um, to circle back to you, but I just want to just thank you. Thank you for so much so much of, of 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 everything you just said and and I'll, I'll catch up in the chat to let you know what people were saying along the way as you were um uh, as as you were sharing um i do want to say first and foremost that um the the what you began with about like part of the part of all of these inseparable urgency culture um you know pressure to compete, um, the class status, all of this, these, these all, they are inseparable. Um, and that message playing out for you all these, you know, all these decades later as still the first thought being, you know, am I good enough? Am I interesting enough? Do I have value? Because value is tied to these things. Um, when in reality, you have value simply by being, everyone does. And Anyway, I just wanted to 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 name to name that. Um, Kat says um, I I uh, that, that that pressure to join urgency culture to feel safe, and um, and and uh, Jessica and John are also. Let's so let's, I'm just like plucking up um, uh, themes for us to all come back to in discussion now around safety and lack of safety. Um, and, 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 uh, Jessica and John brought up urgency culture, um, as being connected to unhealed trauma and specifically trauma of being under-resourced neurodivergent and all these things, all these things are, are, are connected. Um, Sierra. Yeah, I think just jumping off of that kind of idea of urgency culture, especially the, I think the, there's a really interesting relationship between urgency culture and, um, marginalized identities and kind of how how much more that plays I know thinking about school systems like I definitely felt a lot more urgency as a like first generation college student when everybody else seemed like they already had ideas of what a PhD was and how to apply to schools and what those programs even looked like um, and so that kind of constantly playing catch up and I think I've been thinking about it a lot with um the idea of like delayed adolescence, whether we're talking about in queer or trans identities, whether we're talking about in neurodivergent identities and this kind of push of, oh, you have to be on the same trajectory as everyone else. But if you didn't get to experience your adolescence as your true self, then it's okay to take that step back and be that adolescent self, even if you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. Um, and that's really tough in urgency culture where if you're not married and have kids in a full career by 25, then you're failing. <laughs> right, and that connects to the narrative that there's one right way to do the thing, and that one right way is the, whatever the dominant group's way is. And if you don't zoom out and spot that pattern, um, I think that's what allows it to perpetuate. I'm wondering if 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 anyone else has any thoughts about how urgency culture either is impacting them today or has impacted them over the course of their lives that they would like to share either in the chat or by unmuting. This this may be related to all of this. I would what Sarah was talking about how you have to talk quickly you have to say things that are engaging and that people will pick up on and otherwise you'll be dropped i was just reading an article in the new atlantic magazine which talks about shifts in, a, in the culture where all of this has apparently just gotten worse it says traditionally american values had had emphasized qualities like honesty diligence and a sense of duty and that more and more in a consumption-oriented society that's been built, what counts now is charm, likability, and the talent to entertain, is what they're saying. And that now with with social media means enter, 
entertaining a vast audience. But it's it's a little bit the same kind of thing. It's all kind of you got to be quick, you got to be charming, you got to be entertaining. Everything is entertainment. Um, so that's a little scary if things are in that regard. The pressures are getting stronger that, rather than weaker. Absolutely, um, because and 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 similarly to you know how how you know neuronormative um, culture emphasizes extroversion over introversion, um, and I think I, I I think that connects to what you said also, um, and uh, like and 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 like we talked about last week, um, if you are someone who is taking your time to process the information that has been presented to you, um, that you don't have a quick response. That you know, you know, if 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 if, if you're taking your time, you're you're spoken over, and then you're also at the same time given the given the message that it's bad to not be constantly inserting yourself. Um, so like you 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 can't you can't win. It's it's it 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 doesn't it doesn't work. Um, Angela is sharing. This is my first time joining such a helpful, interesting conversation. My 25 year old is autistic with PDA, and I wish we as parents had access to this sort of connection resource information years ago. I see all the mistakes we made. Yeah, so um, first off, Angela, thank you for sharing that. You are not the only one. Um, even 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 folks who, you know, who, who's, whose children are younger um, and are earlier on their journey of parenthood, like we're all unlearning. We're all on learning and 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 we're, and we're we're doing it together um and so i'm so glad you're i'm so glad that you've connected with us jade when uh i first uh started transitioning socially especially uh there was i felt this huge urgency to like start doing a bunch of feminine things and stop doing a bunch of things that I perceived as masculine, which would I now realize is a bunch of garbage. Uh, but it was definitely, uh, I have a cat trying to bother me too as well. Um, and, but uh, it, uh, um, it was definitely rooted in a lot of urgency and a lot of in feeling behind as well and wanting to catch up as well. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really common, um, and and um, it's 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 um, yeah. I'm I thank you for sharing that and naming that for 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 people if at, for in 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 whatever stage of life circumstances to be like, oh, am I rushing the thing because someone I got that message that I'm supposed to, because um, it's it's so easy to get swept swept up in that. Uh, Lauren saying in the chat, uh, so true about jumping in and feeling pressure to participate. I always struggled so much in class discussions because by the time um, I got my thoughts together, my topic was already several conversational jumps behind. Absolutely. And Vicky says, I've always disliked that schools teach, quote, leadership skills and not follower and collaboration skills. This idea that the leader of a group is good while following is bad sets up an impossible dynamic that our culture actively teaches in schools. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Christina says, um, uh, referring, referring uh, back to Angela's comment, gosh, I wish my parents were even at the space you are right now. And gosh, I think that sentiment is held by so many people who are far older than your child, Angela. Um, so, uh, and, and Christina's agreeing. It's so great. You can, can, uh, you can join and there's always chance for connection. Yeah, and 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 uh, and 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 see. Uh, sorry, I'm just I I uh, I have the kind of brain that like when I'm paying attention to the speakers, I miss the chat. So anyway, Sierra Sierra is uh, is is thanking you, Jade, for sharing. Uh, it's absolutely so common. Um, you know, I think I I I I think that that uh, that that comment around leadership skills um, being like the thing. Um, that is taught, although as though leadership means being extroverted, you know, it, 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 power over, you know, it's it's all of that as opposed to, you know, um, 
Liz, Lizzie, can you pull up that, um, uh, if you can find it, don't, don't rush. Uh, we, this is not urgent. We can, we can, we can send it out later. Um, but if you can find that amazing Queen Elizabeth quote that you share sometimes on the, in, in the Slack board, I think that would be, I think, I think, really relevant to this to this conversation around like what leadership could be looking at and it's and, and and if we don't find it really what it is it's around it's around facilitation leadership uh, about connecting with people's values and facilitating not like bossing them around and telling them what to do um and uh vicky uh mary is agreeing with you could not um and and uh and uh, Jessica and John are saying, I used to work at a university and was asked to consult on a program mission statement. I told them to rewrite the leadership definition for that very reason. <laughs> Kelly sharing, uh, Jade, unrelated, but I love your hair. I admire it every time I see you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so so um, yeah, I I... Oh, okay. So Lizzie's got the quote. Oh, yeah. All right. I know of no single formula for success, but over the years, I have observed that some attributes of leadership are universal and are often about finding ways of encouraging people to combine their efforts, their talents, their insights, their enthusiasm, and their inspiration to work together. So yeah, I think um, uh, very, very similarly, um, just as, um, you know, uh, leadership is often kids are taught that leadership looks one way, you get the message, don't be a follower. Um, as it, it, and also like just the idea of winning. Sarah spoke about, you know, a competition winning. Like little kids, when we tell them, like introduce a game, you know, the purpose of the game is to X. And it's usually, um, you know, run fastest, throw harder, throw farther, you know, do the thing. And then we, then, then, then we, um, we give kids the message that they're a sore loser when we didn't even talk about that there's any other way to play other than being fastest and farthest and smartest, like all of it. Um, so it's, it's, uh, I, I try to, it's interesting, um, if I'm around a group of kids, this happened yesterday, even, um, there were, there were a group of kids doing at one of our, at one of our ABB programs, um, uh, something that was not introduced as a competition, a kid turned into competition, because that happens, because, you know, it's, culture um and so um you know um you know look i'm throwing farther than you i say oh is that interesting that you have the kind of brain that is playing to throw that thing farther um i have the kind of brain that's playing this game this way just like modeling that like your brain's not the default because I, I think that's a healthy message for people of all ages um to receive um which is you know why there's there's so many adults who who think that their brain is the default um, and who turn their own access needs into policies, e e even laws. Reading in the chat, Vicky says, uh, there can be no leaders without multiple people following. So this comes to be a leader, not a follower inherently excludes most people. Yeah. Um, and oh, Jade, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm catching up on I'm linking the messages. I'll read them in order. Um, uh, Jade, thanks you, Kelly. I have a longtime family friend who does it, um, and I didn't know it was, what she was going to do until there was dye in my hair. Yeah, so so you got a trusting relationship. That's great. Um, and and yeah, and 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 having fun instead being the point. Yeah. Um, so uh, Sarah, you brought up Alfie Cohn. Can you say more? Yeah, I was just typing a quote, but I'll just read it. Um, so it makes me think of, uh, I don't know if anybody else has heard of Alfie Cohn, but um, he talks a lot about uh, urgency culture related to competition, especially with children. And um, this is like one of my favorite quotes. Um, when we set children against one another in contests from spelling bees to awards assemblies to science fairs that are really contests from dodgeball to honor rolls to prizes for the best painting or the most books read we teach them to confuse excellence with winning as if the only way to do something well is to outdo others so yeah 
I remember when I, I was taking my kids to the library once and, um, and the librarian, it was like, you know, the beginning of summer. And she said, uh, you know, have you signed up to do our, um, our, our book program for the summer? And I was like, no, we're good with that. Because like my kids, they love to read on their own. And if they get like a, a prize for reading, it takes away the intrinsic motivation of something they already love to do. And the librarian was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's counterculture. It's counterculture to step out of that, you know, uh, sense of urgency and, and, you know, reward systems and, and sticker charts and all of that, you know, it's really counterculture. We had a neighbor that had five boys and each boy was in like three different sports and like the cars just in and out, in and out, in and out from, from their home was just wild. And my younger son is friends with their younger son and we had him over recently and he was talking about how he was so happy that he got a break in his practice schedule to be able to come over. And then he was complaining that the kindergartner age got four days off in a row. And he was like, that's not cool. They should be working just as hard as I am. He's in fourth grade. And I was just so sad. I was just like, oh my God, buddy. Like, oh, why, why would you just like continue that cycle? Like you just said how happy you were to have a break and you want to remove that from somebody else. Like, Oh, and it's so ingrained from just, yeah, from like birth on, like, what was your APGAR score? I mean, my God, like, we're not even like a minute old before we're getting scored on things. It's, we're born under stress. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And parents getting asked, like, is your baby a good baby? You know, from the very beginning, it's just like, does your baby sleep through the night? Is your baby doing this? Is your baby? And it's just like, so it's just from the very beginning, you know, that competition and, and comparison. Yeah. Cause there's one right way to be a baby. John and Jessica. It, John is listening in. This is Jessica. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk, I think we're getting at a lot of this, what keeps on coming to my head is rewards. What are we rewarding? Mm -hmm. And what I hear a lot is we're rewarding urgency. We're rewarding neurotypical achievement. Not we like the world, not, not the neuro inclusive world, but, you know, and I'm also asking myself the question, like, how can I support dignity and rest and wellness. Like how can I bring those values in my personal life? Right now it's in work season and it's like annual performance review time. And so I'm thinking about like, what are we rewarding? Like, are we giving people shout outs for choosing not to do a project? Are we giving people shout outs for like taking so much PTO? Like those are things, I mean, there's tons of, you know, a thousand other examples, but I just feel like if we can model things like there's been wonderful examples in this conversation um just continuing to model i think mel definitely had a couple examples continue to model like um uh just praising like people for resting and you know being okay if we have a hard time resting right just being okay with that because that's not uncommon especially for neurodivergent people but yeah I'm, it's got me thinking about like how can i reward the opposite you know dignified wellness, dignified slowness. Um, yeah. Thank you for naming that. Um, so example, so at All Brains Belong, um, we, we've re reimagined performance reviews. We do self-actualization planning. It's a completely individualized experience of like somewhat what, what, what constitutes self-actualization. And we are looking at rest and we're looking at, you know, who's taking your flexible PTO and, uh, you know, like this, th yeah. And we're normalizing, like not doing the thing. Like, I think like, so, so Sarah, can I put you on the spot where we said you did too much last week? I think you need yeah. to do less. That's who, yeah. that's, how, that's how your self-actualization planning went. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, it was really, it was focused on um, the bigger picture and like, 
wow, you pushed so hard and, and then had a migraine for two days. Like, what can we do to have that not happen again? <laughs> you know, and I think just, just making it clear to your employee that you value them for who they are and not what they do and what they produce for you um, is so unusual. And that's, but that's the culture that we have at All Brains Belong. Yeah, and I think that um, I, I I think in 2023 that the time is ripe to be having these conversations because I think that um, there are in 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 the context of the broader um, you know anti bias social justice framework promoting concepts applied to the workplace. This is part of it. You know, this is this is part of having. Um, inclusive workspaces that value people over things, and 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 you you can't say that that you're striving for inclusion, respect, and dignity, and all the things you're quote supposed to say you're striving for if you're not doing this. Um, uh, reading David's comment. Um, I so much understood Sarah's description of getting caught up in the academic or professional performance to the point of realizing eventually that the people who were less defined by that ended up with much fuller personal lives. And, and, and I think that's the story of many people's lives because many people were given that narrative. That was a package that we were fed of like, especially, you know, like I think about, and, you know, I, I definitely perpetuated this, um, cause it was a script, um, that I used in like situations that didn't feel safe to me. Um, but like the, oh, so what do you do? You know, and you like go to a terrible, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't go to large group gatherings for strangers, uh, COVID, COVID, it was only COVID that like interrupted that for me. Um, and, but, but, but I mean, uh, that's, that, those were the conversational scripts, and like, what is that? What like, what, why is that how we get to know people? What do you do? Um, uh, as 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 opposed to, um, yeah, like what Nita's saying. Yes, I'm so grateful to be happy not having a career, realizing that I could have, but work is not the focus of my life. Right? It's about who you are, um, not what you do. Um, so uh, with 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 I think that's a great a great note to end on um, because uh, next week is urgency culture and work. So um, we'll be uh, we'll, we'll, we're, we'll 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 be hearing um, from um, a, a range of panels. They're 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 all pre-recorded interviews with me, all lumped together, um, and uh, we'll have lot, lots of time for discussion. Um, oh, time out! I'm reading Connie. Hi Connie, I didn't see I didn't I didn't see you coming here. Hello, um, uh, Connie, seeing what, what gets you going, what drives you, what do you love? Um, so many better questions than what do you do? And Jade is saying I hate being asked about what I do, even though I love my job. Great, people can blankly stare while I ramble about video games. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's 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 connect via you know identity characteristics you know including you know for for so many people the what you love the what you're passionate about that that is that is so much who you are and that's how um uh, that, that that that's 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 uh such a major part of connection for for so many of us um and 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 yeah so Thank you. Thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you um, to Christina and Sarah and Kelly uh, for sharing your stories and being vulnerable and letting, letting so many people hear so many aspects of their own stories, um, you know, play out in your words. So thank you. Bye, everybody.